Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, Yasser Nouruzadeh. I'm working with uh, Peter Sprong on, in uh, Tilburg University in Netherlands. I'm a PhD student and i in the second year of my PhD. I did uh, a cycle of winner prediction. Uh, first of all, I will uh, introduce a bit about the StarCraft and then I will describe our data set that, the data set that uh, we used. And then uh, I will go through the features that we propose and uh, how we can, how we uh, use these features in our model. And finally, I describe about the um, prediction and uh, other results that we uh, achieve in this work. As you know, in the StarCraft, we have an environment, we have a map, and basically we have the two players in this case. And uh, each player have a base that can uh, gather resources and gas and start to build uh, different units. We have uh, three main races, Terran, Zerg, and Protoss, that we show the Terran with T and Zerg with uh, Z and uh, Protoss with, uh, with uh, P. So we have a uh, sixth combination of the uh, two human players. For instance, here you can see the Terran versus Zerg and the Protoss versus Zerg and uh, Protoss versus Terran. That we call them these uh, three mesh types, we call them uh, non-symmetric mesh types, and we call the uh, three that uh, the two open uh, players have the same race, we call them symmetric mesh types. Uh, winner prediction is a complex work in the StarCraft because uh, any player have a lot of actions that can do, and uh, he has a lot of units. Uh, normally, maybe a player have 400 units at the same time in the map, and they can be in different places in the map, so the complexity is very high. And the uh, player control different uh, units in group or individually at the same time, and uh, they choose different strategy according to the opponent uh, race or opponent uh, player. And the race are different, as you can see here. So the environment is very complex. And we define the player uh, winner that if he can destroy all of the units of the enemy. The winner prediction can be used for, uh, as an evaluation function for designing uh, AI bots. The data set that we used is uh, mainly uh, collected by Sinav and uh, uh, his colleagues that from expert players for uh, SRCraft Brute Wars and then uh, Robertson uh, uh, did some work on it and they provided a database format that is more convenient to work with it. Thanks for their work. And we use this uh, database to process the uh, replays. We did some uh, filtration to have more uh, uh, consistent uh, replies because the game lengths are very diverse. We remove the uh, replies that have uh, less than 10 minutes or um, more than 15 minutes. And also we remove the replies that uh, don't have the winner. So finally we have uh, this uh, number of the replies for each match type. As you can see in the data set, the winning rate is uh, like this one for P versus T is around uh, uh, 55. Uh, Protoss has a more winning rate uh, compared to the Tran. In uh, P versus Z is uh, 51 and T versus Z is 55%, uh, uh, 56%. So this is the baseline that we use to compare our prediction uh, with it. Also in the data set, there are different uh, map, map uh, sizes and different map that uh, <coughs> players use it. Uh, most of the maps are 128. 
dimensions. We propose uh, two types of the features. We call them type-dependent features, time-dependent features, and time-independent features. We are uh, interested to see if the map types also affect the winning rate or not, because different map uh, requires different uh, skills and different uh, strategies. After extracting the features, we have uh, this uh, number of the samples for each map. Uh, map, uh, map, uh, map types. Firstly, I will go through the time-dependent features. As you can see in our uh, in the data set, we have the uh, information for every frame. We uh, gather the information for every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds means the 20, uh, 240 frames. We summarize the features for every 10 seconds. And then we computed the features that we will we'll describe later for every uh, three minutes, uh, 180 seconds. And we computed the mean variance and the different value between player A and player B to see how the features uh, differs between these two players. These are the time-dependent features. First of all, we computed the most uh, frequent uh, commands for each map type. And uh, we see that it, in different uh, match, uh, match types, we have different uh, uh, um, actions, different commands. So we find uh, we just selected the top of them. And then we computed the frequency of each command for each uh, uh, match types. Also, we divided the commands in two groups, uh, micro and macro. We uh, counted the number of the micro and macro commands for each uh, players too. Uh, another uh, uh, view of the commands is uh, to see the commands as the control commands, strategy commands, and tactic commands. We counted the commands in these uh, three groups. And uh, control commands are commands that are working with uh, individual uh, units, but uh, tactic commands are the commands that uh, user work with uh, a a group of the units, and the SRG commands are the commands that uh, are the highest level commands, like as the upgrading, researching, and this kind of the commands. Uh, we was interested to see how uh, uh, how much the, the player uh, expand his uh, base and his uh, buildings, so we computed the number of the Unix uh, regions that uh, every player has. And we had uh, the value for each building for each region. So we computed the sum of the, all of the buildings in uh, each region for each player. And we uh, computed the difference between player R and player B region values to see uh, if player R have uh, more uh, expensive uh, buildings or player B. So this is a comparison between two players. Also, we used uh, two well-known features, uh, unspent resources, that is the how much resources are available at a given time, and also income total of resources that the player collected over the time, and also APM that showed is very uh, good feature for different uh, to, see, to show how much the player is expert and uh, doing some action very fast in the few minutes. And the time independent features. Uh, the time independent features are features that we extracted from the map to see how the map uh, affects the winning rate. We use this uh, information for the map, number of the regions, uh, uh, ratio of the buildable build tiles, because some part of the map we can build the uh, buildings, but some part of it we couldn't. And the uh, ratio of the workable tiles to see how much the map we can uh, explore. We computed the average of the chalk uh, distances to the primary base. And uh, for each map, we have different levels. We, used, we computed the ratio of the levels for each map. And also, we uh, 
consider the map dimension in tiles. So we formulated the problem as a binary classification. If player win, we classify it as one, and if we lose, we classify it as a zero. We used to uh, set up our uh, classification methods, gradient boosting regression trees, and uh, random forest that can work with uh, the unnormalized data with uh, unbalanced data and can uh, uh, learn very quickly. Uh, we tried different uh, approaches. First of all, we tried to uh, model each match type as a, uh, in the, as a separate uh, binary classification. For instance, one binary classification for P versus T, one bi uh, binary classification for P versus uh, Z, and so on. So we have a six binary classification. And after that, we was uh, interested to see if could we mix this kind of the match types to have a, a unique uh, uh, model. So we mix them to two uh, classifier uh, for symmetric match types and uh, non-symmetric match types, and we found some results. And then we interested to see could we uh, put all of them together to have just one classifier to predict different uh, match types at the same time. So we use a general model for, to predict the uh, winning prediction for all of the match types. And the results. Here you can see the results for the individual uh, models. We tried the two combinations of the features. As you can see, uh, A shows that uh, APM and uh, economy features, income and uh, unexpected resources. B shows the time dependent features, and C, time independent features. Uh, the baseline is the default winning rate in a data set. Uh, when we use the map uh, features with the other features, we found the, uh, near the 60% uh, accuracy in the P versus T. And uh, as you can see in the different uh, races is uh, almost the same trend. And when we remove the time independent features, we see that the accuracy improving. So we concluded, because the players are expert, they can come up with the map uh, sizes and different properties in the, the different maps. So the prediction of the winning is more easier. Mm, in otherwise, the map dimension and map properties has not affecting in the winning prediction in this uh, scenario. As you can see, we have the same behavior in different uh, match types. Uh, in the P versus Z, we can see that uh, after removing the time independent features, the prediction is improved. And in the other match type, is the same. And uh, <coughs> most of the match types have the near the 63% accuracy. Uh, except the Z versus Z. In the Z versus Z, because the data set has fewer samples, we concluded that maybe because of the, we have few samples in the Z versus Z, the accuracy is uh, lower than the other match types. Here we compare the mixed models. We have the same table here. If we use the, all of the features, we have near the 57% accuracy. And when we use the time-dependent uh, features, we have a higher accuracy near the 63. For the symmetric races and for general model, we have the same uh, behavior and the same accuracy near the 63%. Uh, we compare the feature importance for different uh, match types. As you know, the gradient regression trees uh, uh, 
assign a number of a number between zero and one to uh, find the feature importance of uh, any feature. We choose the top ten of them. If you can see in all of the match types, we have the income and unspent resources as the best features, except the uh, Z versus Zerg. Here. And the uh, other interesting note is that, uh, for instance, control commands and the region value uh, feature are the next two features that are in the all match types are very important. And uh, if you look at the, all of the 10 features, you can see the, uh, we could say that 10 top, uh, top 10 features in all of the match types is almost the same. Just the order of them sometimes is uh, different. So in uh, Z versus Zerk, we have the micro commands that uh, is the best predictive uh, features. But in the other match types, we have the income and unspent resources. Also, we did the same for the mixed models, for non-symmetric, symmetric, and general model. We see the same behavior here. Income and uh, unspent resources are uh, top two features here. If you look at the top six features are almost the same. And uh, except in the non-symmetric races, we can see the region value have a higher uh, rank compared to the symmetric races. And also, if you look at the importance rate, you can see there is a gap between the four and five uh, features. So we can say that the four top features are very effective in the winning uh, of the player. So we found that, uh, first of all, winning prediction is possible in the different match types. And uh, we mix the models to predict the uh, winning in different uh, scenario. We uh, compared the top features for different match types, and we see that the uh, top 10 features is almost the same, but uh, we have few differences in the order of the top features. And we found that uh, economic features, like as the income and unspent, unspent resources, the strongest uh, feature for predicting the winner of the game. Thank you. Back to the extracting. Uh, yes, here. We basically have uh, the three minutes timer slides after uh, this step. So for uh, each game, we have uh, uh, a slice number one, two, three, and other. And we have the mean variable war and the difference uh, for this, all of the features for each player. So for instance, if the game length is 10 minutes, we have uh, three time slice and the uh, features for these three times. And also we went for, uh, for prediction task. We, uh, if the one slice from uh, a game is included in the training set, we excluded it in the test set. So the training set and test set are completely uh, different, yeah. So, so, if I understand it, so you imagine there's a training set that has three time slices. Yeah. Each one of the time slices, each one of the time slices is one of the instances in your training set? Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. 
And did you experiment with uh, predicting only knowing the first time slice? So how early in advance can you predict the weather? Mm. I did it in the the surprise, but uh, it doesn't have a uh, nice accuracy. Yeah. Yes. Did you test for any interactions between the features, or only so features? Sorry. Interactions like one feature multiplied by another in the linear model. Did you do any of that? Uh, do you mean that uh, actions between two players? No, I didn't try it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. So, one is um, about the prediction rate. So, we know that in later stages of the game, it becomes easier to predict who's the winner. Yeah. Like we had some, some studies like that. So, is that like an overall average you kind of presenting here, or is it something specific to a game stage? Or, or is it so what would only see one for number? Do you also do experiments with just data stages where this number actually should go up? Yeah. Uh, we didn't uh, compare the for uh, during the game. We just mixed all of the slices together and we computed the average of the winning rate. So, so that's the average prediction rate across yeah, the game whole game. Yeah. Right. Yeah, to produce nicer numbers, you will actually just concentrate on the, on the later game. Yeah, yeah. The other question is related to um, the modern question. So you were looking at forest trees, like the random forests and, and, and the regression trees. Uh, did you try anything else? Can you first explain this a little bit to us, what, what these three models actually are, do? And yeah. then maybe as a follow-up, why didn't you use like, some simpler things, like linear models and other known machine learning tools? Like yeah, yeah. Or like machine or something else? yeah, I tried the uh, SVM and uh, some other machine learning uh, models, but they couldn't uh, come up with this uh, complexity of the data because uh, the data is very complex and uh, nonlinear uh, relation between the features uh, and also the, um, the measurement of the features are different. For instance, the, we count the number of the actions, but in the map we have the pixel information, we have different type of the features. So uh, tree-based uh, um, learning model, models can come up with uh, this kind of the uh, challenges. Uh, basically, uh, random forests and uh, regression trees have the same idea. They're using the, a couple of the trees to learn their models. But the difference between the regression trees and the random forests is that regression trees uh, learn some small trees on the data set. And then uh, it, uh, it, they are very weak uh, learners. And they start to minimize the error on all of these trees. And uh, finally, the error in the average will be reduced. And the random forest uh, works a bit differently. It's uh, growing the tree in all of the feature space. But uh, regression trees uh, cut down some trees that are less for features that have less importance and cannot uh, affect the accuracy of the system. So, um, final question, what, what do you do with this uh, information now? You can predict and uh, you have an idea how to use that in the box or make, make you this in your AI system? What's, what's the next step in your research? Yeah, currently I'm working on the uh, a bit uh, different uh, topics. I'm working on the playing style. I started to, to see if the Palenga style is different in different uh, match types. And I uh, studied the relation between playing style and winning rate to see how they are correlated together. For instance, if a uh, playing style have more uh, winning rate, so we can see that uh, this kind of the strategy or playing style can have uh, a more uh, chance to win the game. And also, I. Uh, started to uh, see what is the uh, relation between playing a style and game length. 
so they can have some information about the uh, players, how to play the game, and how they, yeah. Uh, for the future domain? Oh well, yeah, you, you were recording prediction for all the features, but yeah. those were all averages, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe if the variance on that has averages is really high, they're not actually very good predictions. <laughs> the the regression trees um, have very low variance in the when they start to very small trees. The small trees have very low variance. But the bias is very high, and the uh, reaction trees uh, tries to uh, decrease the bias, and uh, so in the total we have a lower uh, error. So if we remove the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the uh, uh, significant test, and we found that uh, the difference is uh, significant. If you mean that, uh, all of them. yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. have a group ID, and when a user click uh, somewhere and do some uh, commands, we have the command ID, the group ID, and uh, the position of this group. So we know which commands where and when are uh, done, yeah. Sorry? Okay, <laughs> fine. Plenty of time. <laughs> so my name is Alberto Riarte. I'm going to present a paper improving turn analysis and application to RTS games, a work done with Santiago Antañón at Jackson University. So motivation. Uh, for those who don't know uh, what is uh, BWTA, it's a library that analyzes the StarCraft maps. So given a StarCraft map like this, it decomposes in regions uh, and checkpoints. So this is used by most of the uh, uh, StarCraft bots nowadays. 
but has some problems in the library. First of all, it's really slow. So it takes like one minute to analyze one map. Uh, and to mitigate this problem, the, they, after analyzing the map, save all the information to a file, and then uh, when you rerun it, it loads this uh, file cache instead of uh, analyze again the map. So this is uh, somehow to speed up the analysis, but you have to analyze it for once for sure. And the second is that uh, it has false positives and negatives. So for instance, we can see the, uh, this region with two choke points, but in the other side, it's the same region with only one choke point. Or here, this region has this at the entrance, here nothing in the entrance and the second one, and nothing in the second one. So it's not consistent. And also uh, in the map here we have a building that's blocking this path that key is undetected. And it takes that this is a whole region and you can cross it and go there. And this is not accurate. So let's improve that. Uh, I, uh, those terms are similar. So we uh, reconnect the obstacle polygons. Then we compute the Bornite diagram, uh, prune this Bornite diagram, identify the region nodes and the choke point nodes, and extract the regions. But uh, we will use the same interface as WTA to help all the other stack bots that are already using this library, the, the transition. And we will not use a dependency on the CJAL library. This is a geometrical library. It is very well done, documented, and robust, but it's too heavy. And if you want to compile with new uh, C, uh, with new compilers and things, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. So it's a really a headache. So we want to get away on these dependencies. Then, first of all, recognize obstacle polygons. So given the, the map, first we detect the walkable tiles and walkable tiles. So in this zone here, this is walkable and this is a not, this is a cliff. So once means that it's walkable this area, zero is not walkable, okay? Second step is we are marked tiles that does not fit a uh, unit. So units need a three by three walk tiles to fit there. If it's not uh, enough room for a, a unit, we mark this tile as not workable because it's not feasible to put a unit there. Uh, this gives us the, the shapes smoother. So if you compare, this is the previous one, and now it's smoother because here, for example, it doesn't fit a unit. Okay? Then, we are marked static and unstable buildings. We have seen that there is a building here that we cannot destroy. So we mark this area as not workable, so because we're going to cross this anyway. Uh, once we have this uh, binary uh, file format of the map, we compute a uh, component labeling using contour tracing that this labels all the unworkable areas and the contours. So it's going to be perfect to get the, the polygon of this area. Uh, since we have all the points of the contour, we need to simplify this polygon and we run an algorithm called Douglas Parker algorithm that simplifies all the line. Instead of having all the points of the line, we have all one point in the beginning of the line and not another point in the end of the line. So as a comparison, in the original one, we see the regions are less smoother than here. So it's, they have more computational time to, to compute these shapes. And uh, the original one, uh, in order to smooth the, the shapes, they expand the polygons a little bit. So why, this is why they are bigger than in ours. So in ours, it's, it's more accurate and it's smoother. And the time to compare, uh, to analyze this in our library is 0 0.1 seconds. In DOTA is 1.2 seconds. So we are starting getting lower times. Then, compute the Bornite diagram. To compute the Bornite diagram, as I told you before, BWTA uses CJOL and produce this diagram. We, instead of using CJOL, we use uh, the Boost library. That CJOL is also dependent on Boost library, so Boost was already there. Uh, and we uh, change the structure, so the, the output of the, uh, the Bornite, even CJOL or Boost, is a half-edged edge structure that for needs is, is too much. So they, we simplify this structure to a simple graph. Uh, the reason why this looks more simple than this one is, as I said before, the shapes are smoother. 
Here we have little bumps, so each little bump produces uh, more lines, and in our case we don't have these bumps, so it produce nicer uh, boundary diagrams. And uh, the time is missing surprisingly, with CGL is 9.4 seconds, and with ours is 0.04 seconds. So this is a really, really nice uh, upgrade of time. Uh, I have to say too that uh, the, the algorithm in CGL is more robust than the boost. For example, it allows to add crossing edges, and it, it knows that and it can handle. Ours cannot handle uh, crossing segments, but we ensure that the polygons that we are introducing are simple. So we did a previous step of verifying that all the polygons are simple, so we don't have any crossing segments. So we don't have to need a robust algorithm to detect the, the pornoid. Okay, the next step, prune the pornoid diagram. Mm, this is a really simple step, it's just removing the, the hairs of the pornoid diagram. To do this, we compute for each point uh, how there is the distance to the obstacle. To compute in this, in, instead of every time compute the distance of a point to a uh, closest point, we use the R3 optimized to optimize these distance queries. So R the R3 structure is a structure that you add all the segments, and then it clusters everything that the ways that when you uh, make a query of at this point, how far is, what's is, is the cluster's uh, polygon or a segment? It's, it's really, really efficient. So this was the, the, the most computational part of the, the previous algorithm that took 2.5 seconds to compute. In ours, it's only 0 0.00001 seconds. <laughs> so it's another huge improvement. Uh, and we have more or less the same shapes than before. This can also be seen as the, the medial axis of the geometry in this map. Now, the identify the nodes. So this is the, the algorithm overview. The idea is start with the uh, leaves of the graph. We check if uh, this uh, position is a medium, uh, a maximal, or a minimal, uh, saying that the, the neighbors are less farther to an obstacle or more farther than an obstacle. We have a, a maximal minimum node. Then it depends on the, the local minimal or local maximal. If we have two consecutive local minimal, that means it's a narrow passes, it's a choke point, or we're going to keep the, the, the minimum of them. If it's a, a maximal, it means that it's an open space, uh, it could be the center of a region, and we keep the maximal of the two consecutive uh, region nodes. To, to illustrate this, I have a, a demo to go through all the steps that is easier to see. So we start from here uh, with a region node, with a blue, and red is going to be the, the choke points or, or local minimal. So here we detect that the first one is, is, is no difference between the distance from this one to the closest object to this one, so we mark this as a chuck point. Here there is, an, uh, there is not enough difference, so we don't mark it as a chuck point. Here it has, so it's a region, because it has this, this gap here. Then a chuck point there. The intersection is always marked as a potential region. And after an uh, intersection, the local minimal is going to be a choke point. Then we have a, a another intersection here, and go so on. So the, the tricky part is detecting what is uh, enough difference between a local minimal and a local maximal to avoid uh, uh, choke points that are not choke points. So here, for instance, it detects that it's a local minimal, but it's really, really close to the, the local maximal that have we've seen before. So this, we don't mark this as a choke point. So we have another choke point, intersections, another choke points, and it's an iteration. Yeah. So the good thing about this from the previous is the, we only iterate through, through all the vertex of the Bornoid once, while in the old VLTA it took many iterations, one to detect only the regions, one to detect only the choke points, another to prune choke points. Here we do all the, in the same step. In the one we're detecting, See, for example here, detected the choke point. But here is a region that is bigger than this one. So the choke point, this is, uh, we discard this because this is uh, too close. Okay. 
here we found another uh, choke point that is uh, smaller than this one, so this we discarded this one and keep this only this one. This is the kind of situations. Again, we discarded this one to keep only this choke point, and we keep doing all only ones for all the graph. Yeah. We are getting there. <laughs> <laughs> then after we have all the, the nodes, we simplify the connections, the edges. So here, uh, all the points are, are really close each together. So it looks like, like we have curves here, but in, we are in set points that are close together. So here, we simplify this, and we connect directly one node to another node. The next step is to merge all the region nodes to the biggest region node. So we only keep one. So we, this is the, the final structure with choke points and regions. Uh, and we have here the comparison between the old library and the new one. So the old one was in 0 0.3 seconds, and now it's 0 0.0005 seconds. So we're still in improving <laughs> use the old one. And the finally, the extract regions, we simply uh, uh, request what are the closest segments to, to know what is the, the point of the, the intersects, the choke points, and then divide the, in the different regions. We do simply geometric operations. So we took all the map as a whole, then we negate the obstacles to have the, the polygons of the whole regions, and then we cut these polygons with the, uh, chuck along, uh, the chuck point lines to get the regions. So, as we can see here now, we have the, the blocking building that we had in the original one. The chuck points that are more consistent, like if we have a region here, it's the same exactly region that, like here, not like in the previous one that this is detected, but this is not detected. Uh, and like here, we have another region that is going to be the same like here, that in the previous was different. And extracting the region polygons also, is, we computed in less time. So it was before 0 0.5 and now it's 0 0.03. Uh, more things, extra cache operations. We compute the labeling of the regions, the component labeling, to make possible queries about, OK, in this uh, position of the map, what region belongs. And this is uh, now an uh, O1 operation. Because we have this map that we can control this directly map position and what is the level of the, this tile. And it returns to the, the level ID of the region. Previously, in the old library, what it was requesting was okay, I have this point. Let's see for each region if it's inside the polygon. So, this is also a very expensive computation for just a simple request like this. More things the base location, clustering resources. We change the algorithm to the DB scan to know where to um, put a, a base to collect and gathering the resources. So we uh, use this algorithm to make the cluster of the, uh, the, the minerals and the gas to detect where we can, we can put this, these buildings. Uh, we also compute this with uh, this algorithm, and now it's more efficient. Before it was 0 0.78, now it's 0 0.06. We compute the maps of uh, closest points of interest, uh, more concrete for the base locations, chalk points, and obstacles. We compute what, what is the, the closest base location for in this case, in this map. From this point, the closest base location is this one. From this, is this one. Uh, this, uh, we compute this with a multi seed float field. So uh, we start with uh, a coup where we insert all the seeds and we gradually increase all the seeds to expand until they collide each other. Uh, and this is an iris for ground and air units. So once we reach a, a border, we increase the, the cost because we jump from a ground, so from a walkable tile to an unwalkable tile. So we increase the cost of this jump and we keep uh, tracking how close it is. So we have this map that the, the captures how more or less the for walkable and not walkable units. Uh, and the times. 
in BODTA, this cache operation took 47.1 seconds. Now it's only 1.0 seconds. That was a really huge improvement of on time. Some results in performance. We tested with a different uh, stack of maps used in the A8 competition. These are the size of the maps. That was the original uh, full time to compute the analysis in the, uh, the BWTA library, almost one minute or more. Uh, and in the paper, the results that I did have three, four, or five seconds. But since the, the paper, I, keep, I have been improving more a little bit uh, the algorithm. And now I have one second only to compute maps. And I have tested more maps. So with one second, I think we don't need anymore to, to share the files and, and then uh, upload again the information that we are analyzed. We can analyze every time. Now it's really, really fast. And I did a comparison of the results of the, the region decomposition in the Benson map. Uh, as was an example, uh, as I told you, it looks really, really better than, the, than before. Other maps are pretty much the same. So this thing this is exactly the same. Uh, the only difference here is this, because this has this little artifact that it detects at a uh, choke point. Here we don't have this artifact, so it doesn't detect as a, as a choke point. This one, I think, it says, yeah, it's exactly the same region decomposition, Aztec. Remember, now it, it, was, it was one minute, and this is one second, and we had the same results, or better. And we still have a little bit problems with some maps, like this one. Uh, this is unclear how to divide this uh, central region. Here, uh, it was pretty close to the, to the standard or a human will divide. The only thing probably is this should be here instead. Uh, and with our library, we still have to tune some uh, parameters about the, the distance uh, between the choke points, or the difference between a uh, node region and a chocolate region to improve these kind of scenarios. Mm, this one was the only problem here, for instance, is these little regions is detected as a, a region, when in the old one is not a region. This will be like a, a corridor, but sometimes detected and sometimes not. So uh, we still have to think about what we will want to do with, with little corridors or the, the minimum size of a corridor, what should be. And another improvement added to the ability to was the, the pathfinding. The original one, it only implemented the A star algorithm. We put the HPA, the hierarchical pathfinding uh, a star is implemented here. Uh, so the HPA star, what it does is device, uh, usually device a, a, a map in different mm, regions, or in different squares, then computes the, the gate that connects each big area. So this is one gate, one gate, one gate. Compute the distance between each of the gates. So when you want to uh, have the, the distance between this point and this point, it only computes the distance with this point to the next gate, and then it already has uh, the cache of the distance of each gate. So if it, this was also already computed in the cache. So this speeds up the computation of pathfinding. The trade-off is, is that it's near optimal. So this is not exactly the solution. Uh, but anyway, this kind of uh, request, for example, uh, here I have the example of computing the distance between the, the base locations in this map. It's going to be these three. Uh, and you want to use these things usually for planning, not for, for reactive control. So you want to plan ahead how far is, is one object. For this, you don't need an the exactly accurate distance, but a fast approximation is enough. So with HPA star, we have a, a very pretty great approximation, and with much less effort. So if with A star, this time is in milliseconds, going to be 41.3, uh, 13, and now it's only 0 0.95. So we compute more queries of this kind for planning pathfinding. Uh, yeah, I think and this is it. So also, we are looking for new PhD students in our lab. So if you know any student interested in RTS or internalizing, <laughs> let us know.
But uh, the thing that in these cases where it's so big, maybe you want also to, to decompose a big region to small parts to make, for instance, okay, if I have my army here, I want to move it in the entrance of all this. It's going to be this part, yeah. not in the here or here. I want it to, to save the, this closer. So somehow it's, it's, it's useful to have a big region decomposed in smaller ones, to move in a big region squats, for example. I, maybe we should, we should trade this as, not as, as chalk points, as a different problem. So instead of trying to detect chalk points here, it's like you say, this is a huge uh, region, and then if it's uh, too big, using another technique to decompose out this big region in the smaller ones, if needed. Maybe, maybe this is another possibility, yeah. That's more of a comment than anything, because I don't think you're ever going to get everyone to agree on one region. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a difference. I mean, if you, if you want to say these 10 choke points, and if you use like this moment, it's like this is the of a choke point, and you well, the position your units is like on this line, and there's the no narrow choke point at the back, right? So then we just use like shorter techniques. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so you can just uh, look at the bottom and uh, realize that oh, okay, this is a region. So in the exact opposite way, we also. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. The, the only difficult on that is that the the symmetries of the maps are, are not well defined. So some symmetries are like in a spiral way. Some others, if it's, it's a mirror, but it's it's not a standard mirroring of the map. So. But, but yeah, it's it's easily, uh, easily. I mean, the, the way the map is symmetric. Yeah, so the, I mean, there are symmetries that uh, only this half is symmetric, yeah. only this quarter is symmetric. Another one is a quarter symmetric, but it's, it's uh, rotated. So you need to detect also the angle. So yeah, it's, it's feasible. I'm only saying that it, it has on, uh, their own issues also. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a nice try to say. So following up on that, it seems to me that the, the labeling of the region comes because when you are going through your warm attack, mm -hmm. in the bottom one maybe you came from the right and you went inside, and the other one you started inside and went outside, right? So since you can start this labeling process from any leaf you want, yeah. you, perhaps you could, for any given map, you could start from different points, and then you would get different assignments, right? And wherever there's a disagreement, there's something to fix there. So you will be able to detect what is Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I have a question about robustness. Right? So you have a question about robustness, right? Computational geometry robustness. So CGR does a good job there. It's very slow, but it does a piece of maybe even rational arithmetic to get the answers right. Like this is point on, on the delivery of a circle, for instance. Right? You want to get this right. 
<laughs> is there any uh, concern here that you, 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 you kind of producing errors just because of rounding errors, or is it all you do is not really uh, that dependent on, on the curse? Uh, I remember when I did some, something like a denomination or triangulation, for instance, right? It's like very imperative that you use like, exact arithmetic. Otherwise, you can get it wrong, and it doesn't look like a like yeah the 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 most sensitive points are the 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 polygons as i said they should be simple no crossing angles that uh, sometimes when you are simplifying polygons this is not the case because uh, if you have a, a little loop or, or bump, maybe because to simplify, you, you cross this and you make the polygon not simple. So you have to be careful on that. Uh, the way to handle is that I kind of dissolve the, the polygons to after detected to make it not, not crossing segments. Uh, the other, there are, there are many little details, like for instance, when you simplify the, the, the uh, polygon, because we start with all, all the points of the line. So when you simplify to get from here to here, it's, uh, it's only two points, not all, all the points. So the, the double scalar algorithm doesn't handle collinear points on the start position and end position. So that was a, an issue, for instance, when uh, I have to add the segments of the edge of the map, right? And when I had that the uh, collinear points in the, the in the border, it caused me problems. So my way to, to go around this problem is okay, if the problem is only with the starting point, and in my case I have issues only if this is in the border, I detect if it's a collinear point in the polygon that is in the border, and I shift this polygon to make the start and position not in the border. That's it. So yeah, yeah there's a lot of tricky things to do, to handle. Yeah. Right, so you can't afford to do a one second composition because then maybe you're going to find out how to like kick it well, in. Ten seconds, I guess? Okay. But you can also stagger it probably, but the problem is that if you really want to, to maintain that, what is it, 42 milliseconds thing, can you just split it across different uh, uh, things? Maybe not. Right? So it's possible, but not recommended <laughs> because we, you will just. The deal that you are at the beginning, requesting, okay, tell me the, the, the base locations, but if the algorithm is still running, you will get uh, wrong answers. Yeah. So you, you, you need to. Yeah, 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 maybe it's still good to, to cache it. Right. I mean, definitely it's going to be faster just to download all the analysis data than analyze each time. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to your closest base locations graph? Uh, no. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe four. Okay. So it's four, no, uh, no, no, no. I, eight by the diagonals are, are less expensive to travel. Sure. Are, are so more, more expensive to travel. This is an approximation because eight directional plug fill doesn't guarantee shortest paths, right? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure like you had, if you had some magic plug <laughs> No, no, it, it, it's like I said. <laughs> Uh, at the end, we have a kind of uh, a rewrite map because this is, if you are uh, an air unit, this kind of, of border doesn't tell you anything. So it's, it's, it's an rewrite. This is not for air exclusively, but it helps to air also.
All right. And uh, something random just came right up. Okay. All right. So my name is Santiago Antañón. I'm from Drexel University, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, Monte Carlo tree search and integration of some machine learning models with uh, Monte Carlo tree search. All right. So let me skip that. So what is it that uh, we're trying to do with this work? So if you look at all the games that uh, we have, well, by we I mean like the whole community have solved in the past uh, decades, most of these games have been solved by using game tree search techniques. Right? If you look at chess, checkers, go, right? It's always like either Minimax or Alpha Beta or Monte Carlo tree search, right? But uh, when we think of StarCraft or other RTS games, we seem not to be able to do that just because like the state space is too large or the branching factor is too big and we'll have numbers on that in, in a few slides. And how can we do game tree search in games where the branching factor is this ridiculously large, right? And uh, the starting point of this paper is like, I'm pretty sure the paper, like almost everyone in this room, I'm pretty sure has, has read several times this past year, is what uh, like the Google uh, DeepMind uh, did with Go, right? Like this AlphaGo system that showed that you can use neural networks or in general machine learning to guide Monte Carlo research in games with moderately large branching factors like Go, right? So the question is, can we do the same thing with an RTS game, right? Can we replicate a similar thing to AlphaGo in an RTS? And in this paper, which is a follow-up to a paper I just presented a couple of weeks ago in, in CIG, we basically explored the idea of using uh, machine learning models to guide Monte Carlo tree search, similar to AlphaGo. And uh, I'm not going to talk about neural networks. We use much simpler models in particular we use very simple, like naive based models. I, I just wanted to take what is the simplest instantiation of these that I can make it work, right? Like without going all the way to neural networks. And I'm going to tell you how did it work. So, well, I had slides introducing RTS games, but I don't think in, uh, for this workshop we need to, uh, I need to say what is our real time strategy games, that's StarCraft. But uh, I always take the chance to introduce old games because I like playing old games. This is Nether Earth. If you guys have never played and you like RTS games, I definitely recommend it. It's one of the really early RTS games. I think it's the second ever RTS game in history. It's so old that computers didn't have a mouse. So in order to you con for you to control units, they had some kind of gimmick to con for you to control units. Definitely recommend it. Very original. Uh, but anyway, so. RTS games, they are complex, uh, multiplayer, every player controls lots of units. It's kind of like a military battle simulation, real time, very large uh, game states, uh, sorry, very large uh, state spaces, very large branching factors, et cetera, right? And uh, why is it interesting, at least for me, to, in, to, to uh, research, do research in these domains? Because humans are still better than computers, right? Like that's the main reason. And why is that? It is because these games have a very large branching factor. So if I take a game state in a real-time strategy game, like for example, if I look at this game state in StarCraft, how many different things can a player do? The number is very, very large, right? In a game of chess, it would be like 20, 30, 40 moves you can do in a game situation. If you start counting one by one all the possible moves a player can do here, it would be a ridiculously large number, right? Uh, also, games, if that was not enough, games are real-time, which means that uh, whereas in chess, people take turns, in these games, there's a bunch of decision cycles per second. Actions are simultaneous. That means that two players can issue actions exactly at the same time, and actions are durative. It, the action that I send to a unit right now might have an effect later on. It, it's not an immediate effect like in chess, right? And also, some games can be partially observable, stochastic, if that was not enough, right? So there's been a lot of work, and most of these sites are from people that are sitting here, so I'm going to skip that. But there's been a lot of work in RTS games. Reinforcement learning, case based research and learning from demonstration, Monte Carlo research, especially in the past, I would say, five, ten years. And thanks to all of these work, several problems have been solved, like the group of uh, Michael has uh, shown how can we do game research with simultaneous actions, with derivative actions. But the problem of large branching factors is still not solved, right? Like, and I think, especially in the past three, four years, as you can see, all of these sites are very recent. There's been a lot of work trying to scale up game research for games with these uh, very large branching factors, right? So uh, this paper, I'm going to present this one more uh, in, that, in that group of papers, right? And wh what I'm going to talk to you is about something I call informed Monte Carlo research. So informed Monte Carlo research is inspired by the work that uh, Google did with AlphaGo. So I'm pretty sure you guys have all read about AlphaGo, but just in case, ha has anyone not read the AlphaGo paper? Everyone has read the AlphaGo paper, okay? Okay, okay. So then, then 
then I'm going to explain this slide. Otherwise, I would skip it. So uh, for those of you who, who don't know, so AlphaGo is the system that Google built to play Go, right? And uh, they were able to defeat, I, w I don't want to say the world champion, but one of the, one of the top uh, human uh, players uh, in the world. And the way they did it is this system had basically two parts. It had a Monte Carlo tree search backend, which was doing search, like standard Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, in addition to the Monte Carlo tree search, this search was informed by a set of um, machine learning models, in particular deep neural networks. So they had a first network that they called the policy network that was trained us using supervised learning. And what they did is, given a collection of 30 million uh, Go board positions taken from human expert play, they have a network that predicts what is the probability that a certain player will do move A, a probability that a player will do move B, a probability that would move do move C, right? So this network, given a board, can predict the probability of a player doing a move. And this probability is used to bias which nodes are we going to expand in the search. If a node has very low probability, then we're going to have a very low probability of exploring that node, right? So in effect, what you're doing is narrowing your tree. If given the 300 possible moves you can do in chess, only five of those have high probability, then let's focus on those five, right? And all of a sudden, the tree becomes much smaller. And they have some other networks like, uh, for example, these uh, p sub pi was a simplification of this one used for uh, playouts. And then they had a, a version of the policy network that was improved via self-play using reinforcement learning that was playing even better. And then I had a fi final network called the value network that given a position in the board could predict the probability of winning. Right? And they used that for uh, evaluating the nodes uh, at the end of the tree. Right? So basically, Monte Carlo tree search using the uh, policy network to buy a sampling of children who do Monte Carlo tree search, and then a simplified version of that for running playouts, and a value network to evaluate the probability of winning given a move. Right? So this is, what, uh, this is how AlphaGo worked. So can we use these ideas for uh, real-time strategy games? Right? And this is basically the pipeline of the experiments that I, I will present in this paper. So what we did is, given a real-time strategy game, we start with, we need a collection of replays of games. Right? We need to have uh, replays of either human or other bots playing the game. Then what we're going to do is we're going to run these replays through some machine learning model and learn what I call an action probability model, which is a, a model that, given a, a, a game situation, can predict the probability with which a pl an expert player would do each one of the moves. And then given this action probability model, we can use it to inform the Monte Carlo tree search in the same way that the AlphaGo team did it. Right? And in this work, I'm not going to focus on if you remember from the previous slide, there was the policy network and the value network. I'm only going to follow, fo focus on the, on the policy network. Right? I'm not going to work on the value network. Right? So for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to tell you one by one, this step, this step, this step, this step, like each one of the steps, how, did, how did, we, did we actually do it? So let's start with the first game logs. So all the experiments we did were in the micro RTS uh, little game, which is an open source uh, little game I built a few years ago. Uh, that it is convenient for doing research because it doesn't require all the engineering needed to play StarCraft. And it, it has a collection of AI techniques built in already that you can compare against. So it is, it is kind of convenient. So the problem is that for micro RTS, we do not have expert play, right? Like, so Google had access to uh, gameplay data from human professional players. There's no human professional players for mi micro RTS. Probably the only person that has ever played this game in, in the world is me, right? I don't think anyone else has played the game. Uh, so how did we get uh, training data? So what, wh one of the advantages is that MicroRTS has, I think at this point, something like 30 or 40 bots built in already, some Monte Carlo tree search, other, other types of search, hard-coded strategies, has many, many uh, bots by several groups. And uh, just last week, we even incorporated one of your AIs into the game. So I just selected six of them and then ma made them play a round-robin tournament Right, and to collect data. Four hard-coded bots that you just implement rushes, and then one Monte Carlo tree search uh, bot, and a Monte Carlo search bot. And I just let them play with each other, and then we collected uh, a lot of data. We, we gave different time budgets for the different, uh, the different bots, so we collected a collection of uh, data sets of how the different bots play. Like For the bot worker rush, we have like 25,000 instances of which actions th does this bot do in different game states? For the light rush bot, 38,000, right? So we have several. And there's a question marking one second. I, I couldn't remember. Yes? 
you know, an instance a game state. A game state that is like in this game state, uh, this uh, player did this, uh, issued this action to this unit. That's an instance. How many, how many, uh, I don't think I have a slide for this, but uh, so I cut the games at 3,000 frames, and I'm running at 10 frames per second, so that's what 300 seconds. But yeah, 3,000 is the limit. But usually games don't go that long. Like if you, a good bot versus a bad bot can win in like 500 frames. And all of these data, I just zip them up and they're available for download. The link is in the paper if anyone wants to uh, have that data. So that's how we got the data. So we have the data, we have the, the replays. The next thing is to run these replays through machine learning to get the action probability models, right? So in Go, getting an action probability model is rather straightforward because it is very clear what an action is, right? But uh, if you read papers on RTS uh, games, like there's actions that do different levels, right? Like you can be talking about unit actions, which are the actions that the units perform, right? But uh, at an abstract sense, if you think the RTS game as a game with a single player, right? We can also think of player actions, which is at every game frame, a player issues an action, which this action basically consists of a set of unit actions, right? So this is what I call a player action, this is a unit action. And the branching, fac the branching factor of the game is actually the number of player actions that you can do at a given frame, right? But in this work, the probability model that we that we focus on is in the unit unit action. So we're going to build a model that predicts the probability with which a player would issue certain actions to a given unit in the game state, right? So we're going to focus about. So what we're going to learn is, given a state and a unit, what is the probability that an expert player which would issue each one of the possible actions to that unit, right? And that is the model we're going to learn. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of these equations, but uh, basically I tried to use the simplest possible machine learning model I could use. So I started with a naive base, uh, a naive base classifier that would just predict the actions. Uh, one little detail is that uh, naive base uh, is a classifier that works very well for, for predicting which is the action that is more likely to be performed, but is really bad at actually modeling the probability distribution of this action is like 30% likely that you're going to do this action, 20% that you're going to do this other one. This probability estimation is really bad. So for correcting for that, if you look, if any, any of you guys who is familiar with naive base, this little thing inside of the parenthesis is naive base. I had to add a um, calibration factor there to actually estimate the probability distribution correctly because what we want is probability distribution, right? But this is basically naive base with a calibration constant, right? just to, to learn the probability uh, distribution. And this model didn't work very well, so actually I built a second one, which I call the action type interdependence model, because what happens here is that the naive base is, uh, is an okay classifier, but it doesn't take uh, interdependencies between features into account, right? And what might happen, for example, is that the model might believe that, let's say, uh, the action um, harvest resources is very likely whenever you are next to a resource, but uh, it is only likely if I can, if I'm not being attacked by another unit. If I'm being attacked by another unit, then it's more likely that I will actually attack rather than. So these dependencies that this action is likely only if I cannot do a certain other one, that's not captured by the previous model. Yes. So if you have like one of your actions, the player action for the turn is, say it's 10 units. Yeah. If nine of them attack something and one of them moves up versus nine of them attack something and one of them moves down, so at the level of player actions, those are completely different player actions. But uh, right now here, I'm modeling only unit actions. So I'm only modeling the go up, go down, or attack. But yeah, for player actions, those are completely different actions. Even though nine out of the ten actions Yeah, even, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why the branching factor uh, it blows up, right? But basically, uh, this is a second model, also based on naive base, but uh, taking into account uh, this it takes into account that some actions might be more likely depending on which other actions can be done, right? But just, I'm not going to go over the equations. Those are in the paper. One of the advantage of these probability models is that they are very quick to learn. A deep neural network might take several hours to train. Uh, this basically takes zero training time because the only thing you have to do here to learn this model is, for example, when it says the probability of A, it, 
Then you just go over to the data set, counting how many times did A occur, right? It's just pure count. Learning in these models is just pure counting over the training set, right? So it takes longer to load the data than to actually train the model. So it, you can run experiments very quick. All right, so we have the, the training data generated by playing bots, the simple machine learning models that are based on naive base. So now we have the models. So the next step is, now that we have these models that given a game state can predict uh, which the probability distribution of the actions, how could, do we use this into Monte Carlo tree search, right? And uh, if you guys remember in Monte Carlo tree search, you have two different policies to guide the search, something called the tree policy, which determines that every iteration of the algorithm, which is the next leaf that we're going to explore, right? I, next leaf, which is the next node in the tree we're going to explore. And then something called the default policy, which is once we reach a leaf in the tree, right? The default policy is used to generate a random playout, right? Like, so we have the tree policy and the default policy. So how can we use these distribution as a tree policy and as a default policy? So the distribution can directly be used as a default policy, right? We can use that probability distribution we estimated and sample actions to generate a uh, playout. But uh, to, me, to use it as a tree policy, we have to do one extra step. We have to uh, take this probability distribution and use it inside of a bandit strategy, which is what is used as the tree policy, right? And again, I wanted to do the simplest possible thing. And the simplest possible uh, tree policy that is used in Monte Carlo tree search is something called epsilon greedy. So what I defined is what I call informed epsilon greedy, which works as follows. Uh, so uh, the standard epsilon greedy just works by given a, a number epsilon between 0 and 1. What you do is at every iteration with probability epsilon, you do with probability 1 minus epsilon, you always select the best action so far. With probability epsilon, you select one at random. Right? That's epsilon greedy. So informed epsilon greedy is with probability 1 minus epsilon, you choose the action so far. With probability epsilon, you choose one according to the probability distribution of your model. Right? So it's, it's a very, very simple, very simple change. Um, and then what we did is we took this informed epsilon greedy and we put it inside of uh, one of the bots that are, is available for, for uh, micro RTS. In particular, we used this bot called naive MCTS that uh, internally uses a collection of epsilon greedy strategies. So we replaced this epsilon greedy by informed epsilon greedy and then we just let it play, right? So how well does it work? So I run a collection of experiments. I hope I don't bore you too much with like, too many experiments and too many tables, but uh, just to see th which factors uh, affect the performance of the system, right? So the first thing is to evaluate all of these, uh, to evaluate the, the, the bots that result from this process, I selected eight different maps from micro RTS. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with the game, this is a map where Two players, they start with one base, one worker, one base, one worker, and some resources. Then another one, they start with two bases, two workers, right? Different, different starting situations. And uh, every one of the uh, configurations that I'm going to test, I always make them play, in each one of these maps, 20 games per map against eight different opponents, right? which were the six that I used for generating traces plus two others. And then what I record is the, the win ratio. Right. So the first thing that I tried is if you just train these probability models and use them directly to play, right? So you do a bot that the only thing it does is given the current game state, uses the machine learning model to see which action would an expert do and just do it, right? Just basically plain reactive behavior. And when I train it from data from this bot, from this bot, from this bot, from this one, from this bot, which uh, game, um, win ratio do I get, right? And the bots don't play very well. Uh, th these ones don't play very well. For example, the worker rush bot, uh, the worker rush bot that originally had a win ratio of 76%, uh, if we learn a probability model from it, the resulting bot only wins like 51% of the time, right? So these bots are not very strong. It's a very simple probability model. Think that th these, ones, th these bots play reactively, right? And if, if you learn from some of the other bots, then the win ratio goes down to like 20%, 16%, right? Like they don't play very well. Something interesting is that uh, when you learn, so this, for example, this, this naive MCT has a Monte Carlo tree search bot. If we learn from a Monte Carlo tree search bot with a computation budget of 500, that means that at every game frame it has, it can do 500 playouts, right? We get a win ratio of 0.19, but uh, the more, the stronger the bot that we learn from, the model also uh, gets stronger, right? So there's actually a relation. If you learn from a stronger bot, you get to play better, right? So basically, the, the bot that you learn from has an effect. The second one is, 
all of these models that I learned, like these naive based models, they are based on turning the game state into a set of fe into a feature vector, and then you learn from from the feature vector, right? So I tried with three different feature vectors, what I call FS1, FS2, FS3. FS1 is basically using zero features, so you just learn raw probability distributions, like what's the likelihood of doing this action period, regardless of the game state. This one had eight features, this one has a bunch of features, like 50 or 60 features, right? And uh, as expected, when we have better features, the, the strength of the player uh, is actually higher than when we have no features. So this, this experiment is not, not very surprising. Also, this one is not very surprising either. If instead of using all the training data, I only use 50% of the data, 10% of the data, of course, with more training data, the bots keep getting stronger. Um, this one actually was, this experiment was interesting to me. So I've always thought that uh, the reason for which AlphaGo worked is because these probability models help it narrow the branching factor. So now we are only, instead of having a, a tree that has like 300 possible successors, we're focusing the search on three, four possible successors. So what I did is I calculated the branching factor, the average branching factor of the trees I was opening. And uh, in micro RTS, every unit has an average of 5.02 possible actions it can do, just one unit, if you consider only one unit, right? Every unit can do an average of five actions. There's about an average of 19.5 units per game state, which means that the branching factor is five to the power of 20, right? So branching factor is very big. But if you look at units by themselves, they can do about five actions. Now, given the probability model that I learned, if I consider only those actions that cap that that have 99% of the probability mass, right? Then we have an average of uh, like about 3.9 actions, right? So the, these models have actually helped us reduce the branching factor about 20%, right? So the tree is actually much smaller. And uh, remember that because the next experiment, oops, I wanted to see if it is the case that uh, the performance is better just because the branching factor is reduced or because the probability distribution means something, right? So basically the question is, if I'm now I open the tree, but I discard one out of five actions randomly, if I don't even consider it, will it still work well or not, right? Does that make sense? And it turns out actually that, uh, no, the probability distribution matters. Ignore the top of the table, just look at these two lines. This is the performance when using the full branching factor, like win ratio of 40, uh, 87. If I actually discard one action out of four randomly, which was basically to be in, on par with that, the performance goes down, right? So it is not just discarding actions that helps us improve performance, it's actually the probability distribution. So this is the results, the, the game strength that we get by incorporating all of these models into Monte Carlo tree search. These two lines here are the baseline. So let's just look at this one, knife MCTS. A baseline MCTS algorithm gets a win ratio of 84% in, in the setup that we have. Now, if we incorporate these probability models trained from different bots into, uh, into, the, into, the, um, into the Monte Carlo research, we can get from an 84% win ratio to like 92, 90, and 92% win ratio. So actually it works very, very well. But uh, something that was very surprising to me is if you see these blocks of three results that I have here, this one is when I use the models learned with no features, when I use the, the models learned with like the eight basic features, and when I learn the models learned with like using 50 or 60 features, right? So interesting to me, when I learned from the models that had no features at all, the performance actually goes uh, much, much higher. And I have to admit, I'm still trying to figure out why that is the case. So a model that is less accurate makes Monte Carlo research play better than a model that is more accurate, right? So that's the result that I'm trying to still piece out. Yes. So when you have the game state, you have to predict the probability of each, each action, right? So this model doesn't even use any features. It's, like, it's just player one usually does 80% of attacks, 20% of move to the left, 10% of move to the right. That's what this model is actually considering. It doesn't use the game. It only uses, so it, it does use some features, but it, the only feature it uses is which actions are legal. Those are the only features. So the probability of attacking when moving to the right is illegal. The probability of uh, attacking when moving down is legal or illegal. That's the only thing it does. This one, it uses features such as 
what is up, what is north of the unit? Is there an enemy, enemy to the north, there's a wall, or there's resources to the right? So it, it does have those features. And this one has a lot of features, like what is the average distance to the enemy base, all of these kind of things. And when I, I barely use any features, the performance goes up significantly. So I do have an, a hypothesis, which I'm trying now to design experiments to test. And uh, I've seen that uh, these models down here, sometimes the probability distribution, distributions that they predict are very narrow, in the sense that they cut a lot of actions. And uh, I've seen, for example, that when you observe these bots play, the original bots are very aggressive that I trained, and they go attack a lot, and they harvest very little resources. So these guys overfit, and they take all the workers and send them to attack and harvest very little, little resources. Whereas this one doesn't do that cut. So I think these ones are basically overfitting too much and cutting the tree. Yes? If you have more features, then no, aren't you just getting, so it's just spreading out your, your samples. So you're not getting enough right. samples for a given set of features. So maybe it's that one's just averaging everything. Right. That, that might, that that might be that, that might be the case. That that might, it might might be the case that for these ones I need more more training samples. But uh, if I so these features are sort of your function approximation. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. However, when just testing the models individually, so these uh, so this table shows this is uh, instead of I don't, I don't know why did I use log likelihood because it's very counterintuitive, but. Uh, this is how well do these models predict the actions of the, the boss they were training on, right? So if this, was, if this number was a zero, it, they have perfect prediction, and lower means worse. So minus infinity is like the worst possible prediction you can do, and zero is the maximum. So with more features, the prediction actually improves. So they, they get more accurate. Yeah, yeah, well, taking the training set, splitting it into train and test, and yes. How many of those features actually have zero counts? Zero counts. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, if, you're, if you're doing your naive best based yeah. counting, and the space is large. Right, right, right. So, uh, so that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Uh, actually, I don't know the answer. There's only, for this one, there's only eight features, and they're, they're not binary, but they, have very, they can take very few values, like three, four values. Like, for example, what is in the cell immediately to the north? Is it empty? There's an enemy or there's a player, right? It's like these kind of features. So given that I have tens of thousands of samples, I would imagine that each one of them has all possible values. But uh, it, it might be the case in the most complex that, that uh, some features, I don't have enough training data. It might be the case for that. Yeah, it might be. Like, I, I basically, I basically need to explore that. But that, that was a very surprising result to me. That a very simple probability model, very, very simple. The improvement is is drastic. I mean, it it gets like 94.6 win ratio. It basically wins almost every single game, right? Uh, and basically, let me just finish because that was that was basically it. So this is the summary. So this is what I did to generate game blocks. I used existing bots. Simple Bayesian, model, Bayesian models for machine learning. Uh, you informed Epsilon Greedy to incorporate these models into a tree policy, and the result is something I call informed MCTS. Uh, the performance, the base MCTS player that I used, 84% wind ratio, and we can get from 84 to 94.6% wind ratio, right? So the improvement is significant. And uh, the conclusions to me, before I actually have the conclusions, is that the change from a base MCTS to an informed MCTS is very, very small. So I see no reason for which the baseline MCTS algorithm that we should start testing in games is not this idea of just generating locks, training a probability model, and use it, in, use it to MCTS versus using the vanilla MCTS that we are actually testing in most games, right? So I think this idea that Google DeepMind had is a really good idea. This should be like, or something like this should be the new like default that we compare against because it can be done in any game even when we do not have access to expert data. The only thing you have you need is some base existing bots. Even just very simple script scripted bots are actually enough to generate this training data. So summary: informed MCTS is MCTS plus action probability models. 
the informed CTS outperforms non-informed CTS approaches significantly. Uh, uh, also, something that I didn't, I didn't want to go into detail into all the numbers, but uh, the Bayesian models that I presented can predict very well the behavior of the scripted bots, but the most complex bots, like the MCTS bots, are not predicted very well. And uh, that thing that I was commenting, that the model with no features made MCTS perform better than the model with complex features, which is something that, again, I, I need to look into it into more detail. And of course, as part of the feature work, right now I use very simple Bayesian models that are really enough for improving the performance, but uh, per perhaps better machine learning models will, will still work better, right? So testing with neural net networks is still something that, um, that I need to test. Improvement via self-play. I trained the models from very simple bots, but now I have a better bot, so perhaps you can generate data with this bot and then repeat the cycle again, right? So how far can you get? And also, I used very simple informed epsilon greedy uh, sampling strategy. But there's many other strategies, like for example, uh, there's a strategy called can incorporate a probability model into UCB. And can, can, how much can, can be gained by defining better strategies? And tomorrow in the main conference, Alberto is going to present uh, a paper that basically takes some of these ideas into StarCraft. And he actually has a better strategy than informed epsilon greedy. So, but I'm not going to take his talk away. Uh, and also, of course, we want to apply this to StarCraft, which we have already done, so Alberto will present that uh, tomorrow. And uh, something that I find interesting also is that, so right now I'm using a probability distribution model that you learned from traces and using, using it directly into Monte Carlo Free Search. But uh, if you have a probability model for a particular opponent, in the nodes that represent the moves of that opponent, you can use that model instead of the general one. So you can actually, there's actually opportunity for opponent modeling and tailoring the search for specific opponents if you know that they're biased towards one or another, or another strategy. And uh, basically, that's it. Thanks. Right, 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 right. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. So I am training against the bots that I trained with. Uh, that. But. Uh, so, for example, this one is trained with this bot worker rush for the default policy, and with this bot for the tree policy. So we're just saying is take these two bots out for doing the experiments. I will have to figure out actually some experimentation procedure. Perhaps not taking, perhaps testing against all the bots. But yeah, you have a point. You have, you have a point that it might be that is actually overfitting to the opponent. But uh, this win ratio here is playing against, whoops, where is it? Where's the mouse? This win ratio here it's playing against all the opponents. So it, is, it, it might be true that it might not be overfitting against this worker rush, but there was eight bots in the experiment, right? So that would be a small factor. But, but indeed, indeed, I think, I think you have a point. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I don't have a plot in these slides, but uh, so the problem with naive Bayes is that if you take it to estimate the probabilities, imagine that you are you have a prediction task that you have, you can predict A, B, or C, right? So naive Bayes is very good at telling whether A or B or C is the most likely, but the probability distribution you, that you get with naive Bayes is very skewed. So most likely, what will happen is that A will have 0.99 probability and then BNC 0 0.0005005, right? And that is because it's this product uh, kind of formulation, and then you renormalize. So because of the, that product, everything gets very skewed. Like things get either very small or very, or very big. So the only thing I did was basically to add a power there to bring everything to the middle. So if you put, uh, is it, 
I forget if you, if you put that as an infinity, yeah, if you put an infinity there in this kappa parameter, you always get a uniform distribution. And if you put the zero, you get exactly naive base. So the question is where in the, in, the, in the middle do you have to get? And to get that parameter right, what I did is I just did cross-validation. So from the training set, you then split it again into like another subtrain and, and test. And then for every model you test, which is the, par the parameter that for that model gets you the best estimation. Oh, okay. Maybe the performance drops because perhaps the system becomes more skewed. Right, that's a good point. So, so I have not tried that, but uh, but yeah, that's something I should try. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can ask the second question, yep. uh, for your first result slide, your Booker Rush, uh, the Jetson of Booker Rush tends to actually have the highest, uh, the first one has the highest uh, binary rate. Yep, yep. Yeah, so worker rush is a very, very aggressive strategy. It is, uh, it is, in StarCraft it would be just taking the workers and send them to attack right out of, the, it, that's what it does. It just doesn't build any melee units, just send workers constantly to attack. And since micro RTS maps are very small, that is actually very effective. So bots that basically are slower, they will get crushed by this strategy. Right. So you learn model that gives you the highest Yep. I think that's correct. I think to model the simple strategies, like, uh, so look at the likelihood ratio. So th this, these four bots are scripted, so they can be predicted very well. They are, not, these numbers are very close to zero, which is optimal. But when you're trying to model Monte Carlo's three search bots, then the, the likelihood of the predictions is actually very, very low. So I think to, pre to learn to predict the actions of either a human or MCTS, you need a much more complex model than a naive base. Yeah.